Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we are going to talk about detailed freehand. Uh, we're going to talk about how you create complex freehand images uh, on your miniatures. Uh, I'm working on my Knight Titan right now, my Valiant, and if you know how I treat um, these robots, it's I like to do lots of freehand all over them. Uh, I think that they're a wonderful palette for it because they have these big, large, flat spaces. Um, as you can see, we've already got some in progress here. So, like, here's one of the leg plates, and the other one. Oop, there you go. And so I kind of work my way around doing a plate at a time uh, on these things. Um, and I thought it would be fun for me uh, and hopefully interesting for you uh, to see if we can do the most complicated one. And the most complicated freehand on these big knights is always right here, dead in the center of the carapace. This is effectively the head of the miniature, right? Like I understand he has an actual face mask, but your eye when you're looking from above is drawn to right here. So this is where we put our most complicated freehand. Usually it's also sort of the largest space. So uh, I've done a couple different designs on the top of these hoods before this carapace, whatever it's called, and uh, I thought this time would be a fun one. So the when you're doing detailed freehand, the journey always begins by spending some time searching around at images you like. Look at what other people have done with freehand. Look at art. Like I spend a lot of time just looking at, so these are all Sisters of Battle nights, so I spend a lot of time just looking at Sisters of Battle art um, that I thought was just, you know, cool and interesting out of the books. Just looking for inspiration. Anything that catches your eye. And sure enough, uh, I was scanning around, like literally just looking at cool Sisters of Battle artwork, and I found a picture, a black and white picture out of one of the old books that had an image of something like this. Basically, the Inquisition symbol, like this is on the shoulder pad of some of the sisters, not all of them, but some of them, I don't know if like it's a particular rank, but it's like the Inquisition eye with the, um, you know, the double-headed eagle uh, around it, and then kind of the halo. Now, I don't know if I'll do the halo since I already have a halo, like I already have that halo down here, um, and it kind of doesn't fit. But So the first thing I did is kind of sketch it out, tried to turn it from what it was in the art into something that I would want to do. So having the individual feathers and things like that, just kind of thinking about how would this be laid out. Uh, just getting the basic shapes down and what I needed to do to create the image, right? So the first thing you want to do when you're talking about a complex piece of freehand is you draw the thing out, okay, to make sure that it's actually going to, that you know what it is. You notice I went right off the side of the page. That's fine. As you can tell, this is like way bigger than this thing. It's not meant to fit one to one. If you're really unsure about it, draw it multiple times. Like recreate it in a size you're comfortable, and then shrink it and shrink it until you get to the size of on your miniature. Uh, if you want to then go farther, you can even paint the outline on it with your brush to really get yourself in the motion of doing it. So that's what I did first already off camera. The other thing I did off camera. Um, already was then I and I don't know if this is going to show up on camera or not. Can you see that slight reflection of that pencil image? Hopefully that's showing up. So I kind of sketched in pencil the outline of it onto the carapace um, just to give myself a rough guide. It's pretty light and that's purposeful. I didn't want to chip the paint. I literally just took a mechanical pencil and sketched out where the various elements begin and end. That way I knew what I wanted to be where, okay? So once I have that down, our next thing is to start painting it. So over here on the edge of my palette, right here, kind of scoot that in, uh, I've got a little bit of um, uh, some Vallejo Heavy Warm Gray. That'll be a nice base color. By the way, you can see, this is just like the actual booklet for the night. I keep the, I keep the night in the shape that the armor plates go on the thing. Like you'll probably notice that, that like these are all in the actual sort of order that they are, that they go on the night. That's intentional. Um, I do that so as I'm working the freehand, I get an image of what he's gonna look like all together. So I keep it in the same shape on his, on the paper. And then I just pick this little thing up and move it around. Not really anything to do with what we're talking about right now, but just for your own sort of edification. This, it's a good way to do knights in your sub-assemblies. Okay, so we're gonna start with a relatively small, sharp brush. We're gonna get some of our, um, 
our heavy warm gray here. We're gonna bring it over on our wet palette. I've had it sitting on here for just a little while. So we have some water in here. And we're gonna grab a bunch of our flow aid because I want this to be pretty mobile. Okay. We're gonna clean off our brush because we don't want to get that thick paint up in our brush. Okay. So as always, we're gonna wipe the back of our we're gonna wipe our brush off on our thumb. And now it's time to paint bravely. I'm gonna move my extra brushes to the side here. Uh, because it's time to start laying some paint down. So what we're gonna do is to start out with, even though this is a very complicated piece of freehand, we're not trying to get it perfect the first time out. And that's the first thing I want to impress upon you. When you're doing very detailed freehand, you're going to need to adjust it multiple times. It will not be right right away. Don't try to paint it perfect in one shot. One of the differences between doing freehand and other things you do is that you have a lot of chances to fix this. As we go through this lengthy process, you're going to see that I repeatedly paint over the edges of stuff that I do, I adjust shapes, I fix edges, all of that's possible. And I, you know, even though most of the base coat of this guy and the panel modulation was laid down with an airbrush with then some brushwork over top, we can still fix any edge. Like, we'll be able to fix anything here we don't like, okay? Trust me when I say that I can take a, I can put a little like, of a neutral color over the side, take some red, paint over that, and boom, it, I've created a new edge. You won't even notice. So the real big lesson, lesson the first, and thing I, I just, if I can impress anything on you, I hope it's this. You can't screw this up. The number one reason I see people say they don't want to try freehand is they're afraid. They're afraid they're going to mess it up. I don't know what that means. It's paint. You, you can't mess it up. If you mean I might have to paint over it some, sure, that could be the case. You could need to then go back and paint something or fix something. That could happen. And that's okay if that happens. That's going to happen once in a while. And when it does, then we fix it. Why do we fall down, Mr. Wayne? Okay. All right, so we're gonna bring the eagle up. Now, the interesting part is, in the image of this, like I'm gonna curve these wings. In the original image, obviously it's a flat sort of image, right? Um, so we wanna actually curve it like that. And going over those other existing elements can actually be a pretty cool thing to do when the freehand kind of jumps over these existing elements. It can actually be a neat touch because it makes it feel more like it's actually a part of the thing. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, I'm I, sure I could paint over these, these parts that are going to end up being metal, um, but I don't want to, right? Like I want them to actually be like this to remain metal, these grates. So we're just getting our outline in here, paying attention to what I did before. By the way, if you uh, have some pencil lines that you end up not liking, right? Or that end up getting covered or not covered over by what you're eventually doing, that's okay. So you can see I'm just like adjusting these wings here for what I'm eventually gonna want. Just kind of adjusting on the fly and that's fine. Again, doesn't need to be perfect we'll have plenty of time to fix it. So we just start by getting our rough outline down. And 
And by doing that, what we do is we create our base image that we can then come in and refine later. The key is this initial pass is really just setting up the outline of what you want. In this case, I'm going to do rinse the brush, and I'm going to trace the other side in the same way. Okay. Again, that's why I have my pencil line on here. The other thing I'm doing at this point is really actually paying attention to like positioning of things. What I mean by that is like making sure that I cover the same amount of space. So like did I extend the eagle head the same distance on both sides, right? Because I want it to be I want there to be a a symmetry to this. And even though this is already like edged and stuff, that's fine. That's okay. So you see me just matching to the other side. I just look back and forth and say, okay, am I matching this roughly up? All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to refine the rest of this image, draw in the rest of my pieces so you don't have to watch me do all this. You get what I'm doing, right? Filling that out, and then I'll be back in a moment once I have this sort of balanced and where I want it, and we'll work on the next step. Back in a minute. All right, we're back. Big, giant, Aegis eagle and Inquisition symbol and everything drawn. As it stands, I don't think the halo is going to work, not only because, like I said, I already have a halo on here, but because if you run the halo over the top of him, it's going to look really weird hitting, like, these gears and stuff. So, this will probably be good. I mean, keep in mind, there's going to be, like, this thing is going to be sitting over top of it, right? And there's going to be a gun pointing out at the end of this. So, we've got to pay attention to other bits when we do stuff like this. So, this should be fine. Like, this space will be mostly covered. Um, and I... I want to talk about why I used the paint I did. Now, why did I use this warm gray, this light color? Well, one, because I wanted something that's going to stand out against the darker red, right? But two, also so then I have an outline that I can now work with and start correcting, right? So the idea is by starting here light, I have the line of this drawn. Now, I don't always start out light. So, for example, when I did, like, the rose bush here, Okay, I actually started out super dark, so I had a dark edge line, and then I worked the lighter color into the middle. Um, you can go either direction. You just want something that's going to have high contrast for when you put this on. Now, in this case, my next step is going to be to take some, some Dalarowney black ink. Over here on my palette. That part will be slightly off. I apologize. This is a tough thing to fit everything on palette, or oh, sorry, the, everything on camera. I'll try my best to to do what I can, but my I don't have a huge amount of the workspace here that I can go with without risking dropping this thing into <laughs> into my palette. And if that happens, I will be very sad. Um, I'm also just going to take a little bit of like black paint. In this case, just some like model air black paint, well flowing paint. I just want a little bit of paint because the ink alone will run too much. So we want to mix a little bit of paint in there. And then what I'm going to do is take a very, very sharp new brush. We're going to go into a dab of our flow aid there. It doesn't matter that it has the white on it. And then I'm going to grab some of my black paint and my black ink. I'll bring that up here so you can see what I'm doing.
Isn't it amazing how quickly, look at that, just instantly turn that flow aid dark. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to start defining some of my shapes. And I'm doing this very carefully because here's where I'm going to start cutting some edges off. So I'm going to think about where I want my edges. And I can balance things here. You don't always have to outline stuff. But I find when I'm doing freehand like this, it can be really helpful to have a nice sharp edge color. And I do it at this stage because one, it gets gives me an actual like more solid space to work with now that I have the initial thing sketched in. Two, it lets me cover over a little bit of the lighter color if I don't like where that ended. I can just zot it out and make it this edge. Three, I can, if I do it early with this, keep in mind, I can cover this over. If you don't want to have like a black line around the edge of your freehand, if you just want it to be negative space freehand, that's fine. Because we're going to obviously be painting all of this. And when we do, uh, we can come in and we can take our paint right up to the edge of this and beyond. Right, so we can cover this black completely as part of our later work if we feel the need to. I find for my eyes it just makes it easier to see and work with as I do this. If I have this nice sharp defined edge The black line also really is going to show me where I have things out of balance. So if I have something that's not even, it's really going to show up here. Now again, even now, we can still adjust. You can never not adjust. Again, there's no fear. There's no mistakes. We can always fix it. There's nothing we can do wrong. When you're working in detailed freehand, you are not, this isn't a quick thing. You're not sitting down to do this to be like, let me knock this all out real fast. You're going to repaint things. You're going to paint things multiple times. You're going to undo work at some point. You're going to redo work you did before. All of that's okay. It's fine. It's a good thing. Because to really balance this takes a lot of back and forth work and that's all right it's good as we build up the image and we work it back and forth unless you're working from like a stencil or something you're not going to get the image perfectly balanced and exactly how you want it the first time all right but now it's easier for me to look and see exactly what's where. So, I'm going to go ahead and keep edging this thing and uh, clean up some other sharpness. Thing like just sharpen things up and then we'll come back for the next step as we keep working. Alright, we're back. I cleaned out the space. I moved everything else out because I didn't want to be dragging paint over top of my other free hand anyways. So, and now I can have part of the palette on screen. Okay, so We've got everything kind of outlined. You notice I separated like my shapes. I also put the skull in, just like an outline of it, what I want, gonna want there. The other thing the dark lines help me do is start establishing what's gonna go over top of what. When you're doing detailed freehand, you need to establish the, we're gonna need to establish the illusion of depth. And we're gonna do that through contrast. So just like with any miniature painting where it's contrast, 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 it's gonna be the same thing here. Uh, so now our next step is to start filling this in <laughs> basically and the bird itself uh when we think about it so you know it's important we establish what are the colors of this thing going to be and so the bird itself is going to be the sort of golden aegis eagle 
double-headed thing. This has a name. Uh, so we're gonna lay down some brown to base that out. We're gonna bring it dark in here. So then we can take the Inquisition symbol itself, okay? And on the edge of the Inquisition symbol, what we're gonna do is we're gonna run the edge of that in uh, a very bright outline color. Uh, so basically we're gonna turn the edge into like, uh, basically a, a dark color, like a, a black, we're gonna have then a white line. We'll do a gold line in the middle here where we have this open space, all right? And so then we'll kind of trace our, our white here. We'll bring shadows down to the bird so it looks like it's kind of falling away and the, the eye is laying over top of it. So we'll bring our darkness here along these edges. Um, and then we'll have our skull here in the center and this should be uh, our brightest sort of item on here, right? Uh, so that's basically our plan. Um, so knowing that we've got a golden bird, <laughs> that that's what we're aiming at, uh, we're gonna go from there. Uh, when it comes to this open space in the eye, um, traditionally, like the Inquisition symbol often has this as red, uh, though not always, and though sometimes it's textured. There's lots of different ways this, this open space can show up in the middle. Uh, and in all honesty, I'm not totally sure what I wanna do with it yet, and that's okay. You don't need to know everything. You should have a pretty good idea when you're doing detailed freehand, but I don't know what I want this to be yet. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work the rest of it, and when it comes to this void, well, we'll figure it out as we go. It's fine. We don't need to pre-plan everything. So we're gonna take some of our, now I've got some extra uh, opaque brown, also from Vallejo Game Color. The extra opaque colors are great for laying down your base sort of freehand. So again, we go into our flow aid here, get this going. Okay. And what I wanna do here with this brown is kinda of get some paint in the areas that I think I'm gonna have as, um, as gold. Okay. So, this is effectively base coating, right? That's all we're doing right now. And the difference is, I'm not gonna show you all this on camera because I don't wanna bore you to tears. But the difference, but I wanna show you kinda how I think about this. When I do this, I'm not gonna fill everything completely, right? I'm gonna leave part of my outline there. Now I can fill out all the white and just leave the black. And then I can even, and I can do that slowly. Like, so I can make sure I like what the shape looks like. And then I can come back and just touch that up. So it's base coating, but it's a little bit more careful version of the thing. Now, previously I had obviously um, edge, sort of edged all of these uh, panel lines and such, but I'm not really gonna worry about them a great deal here. If I paint over, if I get some paint in there, that's fine. Because I'm gonna come back to this later and redo these edges. Like our final step, we're, we're not even close to done because after this we've gotta still weather everything and do all that. So, and part of that will be re-edging uh, re everything. So, at this point now, I'm just gonna get that brown filled in there. Um, also, since I've got some spaces like this in the middle that I know are gonna be gold, like around the I, the letter I, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this opportunity to sort of clean this up. So I'm gonna come in here and try to establish a more careful and straight baseline of this. And if I mess it up, you just wipe it away. I can come back with my white, but this is sort of my first attempt to get this a little more even, a little more spaced how I would want it, make sure I've got enough room here to trace all of this down. Right? And I can at the same time even out 
my white and make sure that that's nice and straight. Now, we don't worry about getting it perfect. We're not at the perfect stage yet. We're a long way from the perfect stage, okay? When you're working on detailed freehand, the key is you need to start big and refine, refine, refine. So this isn't about, again, I, I know I said it before, but I'm really gonna keep hammering this because this is one of the things I see people sort of get wrong is they think about it like they try to paint their final image right away. like, And then they get frustrated because it doesn't look like that. It's not going to. It's not gonna look like the final thing for a while. And that's okay. We think about it as starting big. We're starting with the big major spots, right? The things that matter. And then from there, we're just refining it. And as we go along, we're gonna get smaller and smaller. Our detail is gonna get more and more uh, tight. And then at the end stages, when we filled everything in, we've got our colors, then we're gonna start working and we've got you know transitions and contrast and all of that. Then we're gonna start fixing all the little things, moving things to the right place, making sure everything's perfectly balanced, all that kind of stuff. At this stage, we're still just getting our basic shapes down, getting our basic colors in to work with, all of that, okay? We're making sure that where this is going is to a good place and that we've got the right sort of shapes down, things are balancing out, all that sort of stuff. So that's this stage. Okay? All right. So you get the idea. I'm just going to keep base coating this out. The brown also, by laying down a neutral tone like this, my, this sort of, you know, warm gray is a neutral tone. My brown is a neutral tone. By working in these mid-tones, I can then go in any direction I want from here. It makes it easier for me to do that later. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and get this thing colored out with sort of the basic colors I want. I'll probably fix a few edges here or there. And then we'll come back and we'll start laying in some, some actual color. We'll start refining this. All right, we're back again. And some things have changed. So first of all, we got all the brown in. And as I was looking over it, I realized I didn't like the amount of focus being drawn here, which is really the center of where I want people's eye to come. So I thought to myself, well, I need something bright. And then I thought, well, I, you know, this thing has a nameplate. Right, your your Titans have like a nameplate, which is here and already done, right? But that sits like way under here. It's very hidden on this guy. So I thought it'd be neat to put something uh, up top and have a little logo there. So we got the basic of a little scroll in there that's kind of flowing to the side, a little stylized scroll work. I also kind of filled in, um, again, when I use the black lines, I use them to set what's over top of what. And I wanted these these feathers to sit over top of these feathers. I'm not sure if that's like accurate for a bird. <laughs> like that is to say, I don't, I don't know how they'd actually be layered if it was a bird, but I don't really care because we're not trying to, I'm not trying to paint a bird here. I'm trying to paint something that's an Aegis and I want the eye to be drawn this direction. So that's how we're gonna move that along. Okay, so there we go. We've got our big bird all sort of painted in. We've got the basic colors down. I can look at that and say, okay, I like the general direction of where that's going. So next up, now we start sketching in our values. So the next thing you want to do when you're doing big freehand like this is you want to think about the, as I said, when, when we want to do this, we're establishing contrast. I use the dark tone on this gold so that I could go higher, okay? And what I mean by that is, uh, I don't mean like, uh, I wanna take you higher. Uh, I mean, I wanna be able to establish where my light is gonna fall in my image here. Just because this is flat, it's one of the reasons I don't like straight decals on miniatures, because they look so flat and boring. Like a regular decal with nothing else going on with it just looks so flat to me. Whereas when you can create the illusion of depth and contrast, you can get something interesting. So I'll reference back to this other piece here, okay? 
So where we've got the skull, again, you can see like the light and shadow in the skull where we've created depth on the ring, right? So it's not just a flat image of like the halo and the skull. Everything has a three-dimensional quality to it and that's achieved through contrast. We're gonna do the same thing here. So, actually I'm gonna use, I'll grab this one. I'm just stuck, I have a couple different size brushes here. I'm, cycling through. Um, here I'm going to use some scale color uh, Mojave White. Uh, this is a nice sort of warm neutral tone, great for the highlight on gold. We're going to just go into that same flow aid. I don't really care that it's all dark and messy. The white will overwhelm that fast enough. If this was my final paint, I would be putting down new flow aid to make sure I had a nice clean white, but this isn't my final paint. This is just my initial value sketch. So, now I need to think about where my light placement goes. And as I think about that, uh, in terms of this bird, the thing I definitely know for sure is here on the wings. So here on the wings, I know that I'm gonna take a light source up here to the edge of these wings. And I'm going to go ahead and paint more than I actually want. That is to say, I'm not actually wanting all of this to be white, but I'm going to go deeper than what I will actually turn white so that I can then easily, when I start uh, bringing back my like glazes to turn this into gold later, have a better idea of what I want to do. Now here on the next level, I don't want to take it, I'll probably place my highlight more here, like in this area right here. And the reason I want to catch that is because I don't want to run it out here on the tip or else it's going to get chewed off by this vent and then I'll have no highlight here at all. I don't want to put it right in this spot here uh, where it's going to get lost. So I probably want it right along this space. Like I don't want to move it too close. I don't want to move it too far. So instead, what I'm going to do is just get a nice white there in the middle. See how I like the look of that. Again, no part of this is complicated yet, but it is time consuming. <laughs> when you're doing freehand like this, it's not, it's not a fast process. I'm not going to lie to you about that. Anybody can do this. You know, just to like a, a note on this, because again, lose the fear. You can't screw anything up. Let's say I got to a point on this that I just absolutely hated. Okay. Like I get to this and I just decide, you know what? I, I just, I can't do this. I can't do it anymore, guys. No, like if I got to that point where I just absolutely hated whatever I had put down here, right? Um, who cares? Then I would just take this back to the airbrush booth and fix it. Like I could just spray paint over all of this with the, with my airbrush in 10 minutes. And that's it. It's done. Like gone away. That's all. So again, there is no risk here. I'm not stripping anything, by the way. I, I, I see a lot of people say when they screw something up, like, well, I'll just strip it and start over. How thick was your paint? that you need to strip something and start over. I, it's, that's an idea I do not understand. Um, here we'll run a, like sort of a double-edged kind of sword on the bottom there so we can transition the change. Um, but if I, so there's, you just gotta kind of start Putting these values in, seeing how you like them, seeing how they look. Are these highlights going to be in roughly the right place for you? To start establishing that contrast. Again, we're working big here, right? By that, what I mean is like this is not detailed work. We're just getting some values down so we can see. Oops. 
so we can see how things are going to shape up. All right, so. Start laying in that white. You can't mess it up. You just gotta work it in and adjust and adjust and adjust. Now up here on this head, of the bird, it presents an interesting challenge. Because obviously I'm going to need to turn it white at some point. Like, there's gotta be a highlight up here, right? But like, where is the highlight actually at? Where does this highlight actually sit on this bird? On this birdie's head? So I gotta kinda think that through from an angle of both what's gonna sell the sort of pseudo NMM effect that I'm going for. Although this is stylized NMM because it's it's something painted on a thing. So it's some other artist's interpretation of what that would be, right? Um, but also what's gonna draw the eye where I want it. And thinking about it, if I have a light source that's kind of coming down and reflecting out equally over the thing, that's kind of what the artist seems to be intending here. Like I'm literally imagining the artist doing this in the world where somebody's up on top of this giant robot with like a spray paint gun, just like psh, going to work, right? What would they see? And in their mind, the eye is going to light, be lit up, and they want to draw the attention to the center. So they would highlight the back of the head in both cases and create a directionality down toward the middle. And then to make sure this beak doesn't get lost, we pop a little highlight onto the edge of both those beaks. Beaks. It's a great word, beaks. All right, so now that we've got that kind of placed in there, right, and we can see, do we like how those highlights look? And I think the answer to that is yes. I'm pretty happy with how that shapes up. At the same time, I can go ahead and reinforce my, um, my scroll here, because you can see how I put it on there didn't cover over everything, that's all right. I was working kind of thin. Can do a nice second layer here just to get that down. Nice second thin coat of this just to get that scroll nice and drawn out. There we go. So that's much stronger now. The whole time I'm working back and forth with this, I'm just trying to establish sort of the balance of it. Okay. So, I like how that looks. I think that that's going to give us a nice base to work from. So now begins some lengthy work. Because now what we're going to do is we're going to start working the bird. Right? I'm going to work from the outside in on this. And sharpen up as I go along. So, here's where we start getting to some detailed work. So i got to change some paint around. I might reinforce a few of these whites just a little bit off camera. Um, sharpen up some of my lines, my edges where I want things to be dark. Uh, but that's just literally clean up. I'm just reinforcing what I did before. And then we'll be back in a minute and we'll actually turn this into gold. Gold. Alright, back in a minute. Okay, so we've reinforced some of the white. We got that in there. Now we're going to start building in our actual color. So here's where we start. Again, we're still not doing detail. Detail, working small, that's the last step. But I've added a couple uh, additional paints to my palette here. Specifically, I've added some Dalla Rowney uh, Ochre ink. This isn't yellow, this is the yellow ochre. There you go. Uh, we've added a little uh, Model Air Light Rust. We've also added some Dalla Rowney Sepia ink. Fun stuff. Okay, so... Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to pick a, a wing section here, and I'm going to show you how I work this, um, because this is going to be, I'm just going to pick one wing section, do it, and then I'll repeat this thing like a hundred times. <laughs> so, but I won't do, I won't subject you to all of that. Okay, so I'm going to start 
by remembering that I need some new flow aid. Uh, because now I am doing actual color work, so it matters more. There we go. That's what I'm going to start with. Okay. I'm just going to get that in my brush. Dab some of it off. Then I'm going to go straight into my yellow ink here. Touch of my rust. Pull that out here. Just to kind of kill that down a little bit. Okay. Now, what I'll pick that I think I can show on camera nicely is this little wing right here. We'll do this one wing. So I'm going to start by, and everything here is going to be directional. I'm going to start by pulling this yellow in. Okay. Then I'm going to grab that rust. I'm going to pull that rust down. Then I'm going to grab some of that sepia. Pull that sepia down. Get some of that white. Or I should say that um, uh, Mojave white. Now here's where we make some choices. Like is the highlight going to fall along the bottom of the wing or the top, right? And that is to say these things look better when they have some kind of directionality to them. So in this case, we're going to take it along the bottom. Go back to my yellow. All of these paints, I'm working thin, I'm working with the flow aid, I'm keeping it quite transparent. Okay. Now I've got a little bit of regular white on my palette here as well. This isn't my final edge highlight, but it's just tracing in where I want some extra white. Okay. Then I let that rest because I want that all to set to dry, all right? But the key with this is, I would then repeat the same thing. I'll do a second wing section while waiting on that to dry. If I do two, I think I can go back and forth and show you what I'm doing quicker. Again, you'll notice I work with the paint while it's wet. It's thin, but wet. I'm not cleaning my brush in between. I'll do the second wing because you can see how by making that choice to put the highlight along the bottom, that means I need to contrast it. So that means we need to take shadow and work it up in here, right? So it looks like one wing is sitting on top of the other. If I did it the other direction, if I put the highlight up top, then it would look like the wings are being folded into each other. You set your directionality. And like, even if you're never aware of this when you're looking at it, your brain is going to catch this. Like, even if you don't consciously think about it, your brain absolutely notices this stuff, right? It's going to perceive one of these things as being on top of the other because of the nature of how you've structured your light and shadow. Okay. 
All right. So now what I'm going to do at this point is I'm trying to create, I'm going to get the basic, you know, sort of non-metallic sketch down. This isn't perfect yet. My blends aren't perfect yet. That's not what I'm aiming at. What I'm trying to do here is get my color down across the wings, right? So we're not gonna take each wing to perfection, each sharp edge highlight, each smooth blend. That's for later. That's for our glazes when we come back in and we smooth this all out, we pop out our highlights, stuff like that. At this point, what we're trying to do is establish our color pattern through some quick wet blends like this to make sure that we like how it's gonna look. Right? Did, is our value, are our values all in the right place? Is everything generally going correctly? So now comes a long step for me <laughs> because I have to do this over all the wings. Right? So I'm gonna take this whole bird, turn it gold. Uh, and once we're done with that, uh, I'll also do the inner ring here because then we'll get to see how that contrasts uh, before I do the outer line. Uh, here to so we're gonna kind of make a final decision like right now I have a few too many lines like dark white gold white black like I'm going to need to cover something there So I'll get that to be gold and then we'll start and then at the end we're again We're gonna sharpen up our edges sharpen up our edges as we keep refining and working it down. Okay, so Turning it gold and I'll be back in a little while All right, and we're back so I brought the camera in tight because now we are going to enter the long-awaited cleanup phase. I've got fresh paints on my palette, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through, you can see everything here is like roughly blended. We've got our, got our big gold eagle. We've got the general sense of where my colors are gonna go, but things are very rough. Now is the step where we're gonna come in and we're gonna start cleaning things up. So I'm gonna do the same two feathers we did last time as an example. Um, so we've got a little bit of our flow aid here. I'm going to grab some of my Mojave white, a little bit of white ink, mix those together. And now I've got a really sharp brush, not anything weak anymore. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to find that edge. And I want to draw that right in there. Get that nice, real sharp line, All right? I'll fix up the other one from the other. Like, and again, I'm going to push these lines down to be like razor, razor thin. I'm going to grab some of my yellow ink mixed with my light rust here. And down toward the bottom here, I'm going to actually pull that into that color, right into that white. All right, so I'm just smoothing out that transition. This is the part where we start working our nice, thin glazes. just slowly bring this all together. So what we're seeking to do here is get a nice, smooth, effective transition. So we're going to thin it We'll do a little void blending there on the edge, right? So we get that nice effect and we want it to run from that light up to that dark because the feather above this is gonna have the same effect, right? So you see how it's gonna work here on this lower feather because I'm gonna go into my darker color. So here I've got some black leather, which is a nice shadow color. Mix it with a little brown to warm it up just a little. And then similarly, along the bottom side of that, okay. I'm 
we're gonna really bring that shadow down. I'm gonna go up to my other feather and just reinforce that as well. And then again, just blend out that glaze right there. Just void it right out and get that smooth. Now, if that's too dark, what I can do, I can take my slightly bigger brush, go into my ink, my thinned yellow rust ink, right? And I can just pull that at the angle. You notice I'm being very intentional with the angle of my brush. You see how my brush is meeting it? I'm not going straight on. I'm at sweeping down. The paint collects to the tip of the brush. By working along the side like that and fanning the brush out, I'm forcing the paint to be the most intense here and the least here. So this part naturally ends up thinner. Then I can void it out and just smooth that edge. And then we start to get these nice smooth transitions, right? At the same time here, like on the eye in the middle, right? You can see how like that's rough. You can see how there's too much uneven blackness in the lines. So what I'm gonna do is go through and clean up every one of these lines. Like everything now gets smoothed and sharpened. And so we just work our way around nice and carefully, smooth out the transition, then we shape the lines. Then we smooth out the transition, then we shape the lines. Right, I'm gonna work all the way around this thing until I've got the color balance where I want. And every feather, those previous like black lines and stuff that I've drawn, I've got them nice and thin. And we go from something like this, where you can see they look kind of the same at that point, right? Like there's kind of a similarity there to something like this, where there's still a clear directionality to the light, but look at how much more this stands out here, sorry, this stands out here, than here, right? So by adding that over under contrast, basically horizontal as well as vertical contrast, then we get something that really becomes three-dimensional. Now I'm doing this here with gold. You don't need to be like, and so this is sort of a non-metallic blending exercise. You don't need to go this crazy. Whatever you're drawing, be a skull, a rose, a sword, I don't care. Like a thing, whatever the thing is, just make sure you've got a transition on there. And because it's two-dimensional, you have to push that contrast up. And when you have these thick lines from establishing your shape, what you need to then do is go back and be fixing them. Like this circle is a great, a great point. Like you can just look at that and see how sloppy that circle is. Like look at that, that's terrible, like right there. So I'm gonna have to come in and fix this by slowly expanding it out and making sure that everything fits here. I have to pick a color for it, that kind of thing, right? Because I want this skull to really pop. So I don't want this to be a white circle around it. So I'm gonna have to make some hard decisions in here at some point. But my next step is literally just to go in and start shaping all of these out, doing exactly what you saw me do. Really smooth, controlled lines. Then I kind of get it under control where I'm pulling my glaze over that previous line so that now I'm using that undershading. There's still a transition here, right? Even though I started with just a straight, basically white line. But by then pulling the glazes down directionally later, I get this nice transition effect in the highlight, right? So, that's the next step. This is where we clean everything up the first time. So we're gonna seek to, we're not going after perfection yet, but we're going after cleanliness. So we're gonna try to move over everything, get our blend smooth, get our edges sharp. If we see errors around the edge, like I can see one right here, right, where I kinda went out the line, then we're gonna fix that. All right, we're gonna fix all this stuff, get nice, smooth, crisp edges to everything. And, uh, and then we'll come back and we're gonna talk about how we then keep pushing this around and start taking things up to the, the next level. All right, back in a moment. All right, and we're back. So many hours have passed <laughs> since uh, a few seconds ago in this video, um, but we've got everything uh, now colored in how we would want there. And you can see how we draw the light. Like one of the interesting parts about doing sort of very big or detailed freehand or, or just sort of a, a general rule for modeling in general, painting in general, is that you wanna have sort of rings of contrast. 
So here we've got uh, an outer ring of light and then darkness and then a new ring of light and then darkness and then again, so right? So we create these circles that draw movement in. Um, <clears throat> so now we come to an important decision and you can see there's still little mistakes like uh, right here on his nose, you can see how that white isn't quite perfect and smooth. Right here needs to be a little sharper. You know, like there's still little things we'll have to go and clean up. This line right here isn't exactly accurate. These are things we'll get in our final pass. One of the key components to doing like really big freehand like this is that you wanna make sure uh, you go back one final time, uh, look at it on camera, which is what I'm doing now. Like I'm looking at this in front of me on a, on a big screen. Um, you'll see things on camera when you look at something digitally you won't notice when you look at it in like with your normal eyes. I don't know why that is. I just know it's a thing. But now it comes time to make an important decision, which is what to do with this red area, right? Um, we've left this basically the same modulation as the uh, as the outer carapace. And we could continue to do that. We could we could leave it that same flat red, but in all honesty, it feels boring and uninteresting compared to the rest of the the space, right? Like one of the problems here is we've got a lot of visual interest here, and you know once we get the skull and the the tapestry done, which will be the last things we do, um, this is pretty flat by comparison. You know, the panels are modulated fine when you're looking over the scope of the whole carapace. Um, but when it's just in this particular small area, it basically just looks flat red. So what we're going to do is, again, I returned back to this. So I sort of looked at a bunch of Inquisition symbols online, right? Like I turned to our old friend Google and I just looked at Inquisition symbols in art, in books, in all that stuff to see, you know, how other people had interpreted this symbol and what they had done. And one of the things that I noted is that people often make, um, let's call it almost like a marbling effect in the middle here or some kind of sort of visual cues of lines and breakup to create more, more interest, more difference between light and dark. And I thought, hey, that'd be cool. Let's give that a shot. So we're going to do that. And the way we're going to do that <clears throat> is we're going to have some fun. Uh, and by that, I mean, we're just going to experiment and let our brush play and see how it works. We're just going to paint some happy little lines. Uh, you know, when, like I said, when you have a big freehand image you're working on, it can often be useful, and I know I'm kind of off camera here on my palette, I apologize, but I'm just, I'm mixing some black paint uh, along with some flow improver. So it can often be good to have a, a, a large idea, right? So again, returning back, returning back to our initial sketch. But we don't need to have it perfect. So what we're gonna do now is We've got some nice, well-flowing black ink. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start making little lines through this. And we're just gonna kinda see where these go. I'm gonna try my best to be random. I'm not gonna focus too much on having similar shapes. Some will start and stop. Some will just go to weird random places. And what I'm doing is effectively just enhancing the space I have to work with and the visual elements I have to work with by making new points in the model that I have control over. One of the things we do when we're, when we're painting in general is the sculptor is telling us a lot when they paint it about how things should be, right? Like a belt is a belt. We know what a belt looks like, so we paint that belt some kind of belt color. Maybe it's brown, maybe it's black, but it tends to, you know, it's a belt. So we paint it like leather or some kind of cloth or something like that, right? But the sculptor has chosen that for us. We didn't make that decision. Here, 
what I'm trying to do is say, okay, the sculptor, you know, gave me these options with things like this window and stuff like that, but I've chosen to say, I'm not going to use that. Instead, I'm going to make my own, I'm going to substitute your reality with my own. Okay? So. And that's one of the fun things about freehand, is that you get to, you get to decide the elements of the model that you want. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a little bit of a light color. Um, so I'm gonna grab some of my um, some of my extra opaque warm gray. And I'm gonna mix in a little bit of my Mojave white just because I wanna whiten it up a little bit. Turn it a little more into a warm ivory color instead of a warm gray. And then I'm gonna find those lines I just made and I'm going to pull paint down towards the bottom of them. So I'm going to respect the line itself that I randomly created. I don't have a lot of paint on my brush, but it's flowing very well. Again, we're using the Flow Aid to make sure, in general with this project, I'm, I've more or less got Flow Aid on my brush at all points in time. Some little amount of it, because I always want to make sure that what I'm doing, I've got nice, smooth, well flowing paint. And what I'm going to do is just push a bunch of spots of lightness down toward the bottom here. And you notice I tried to make these different size. One I have there in the middle. We'll think about how we handle that one in a moment. we do want these to contrast some. So with this one, let's actually run the light up against this side. In other words, because this point was right up against this one right next to it, instead of running them all directionally the same, I want to be able to later on, within my next steps, create some light against dark to make this all really pop out. So we make some choices on our angles here and there of where exactly we push the light. If you've ever painted uh, Iron Jaws armor, the way that that armor is broken up is kind of what I'm trying to recreate here to a point. Not exactly, but something similar. So we go in here and we push these little spots of light down into the bottom. So what we've got now, and you notice this is fairly thin because I've got that flow aid and what that lets me do is come back in and trace particular parts or small areas. And so now we've got this sort of broken up feathery effect. Now, we're going to do the same thing in reverse. <clears throat> so I'm going to take some, uh, get some Flow Aid. I'm going to get some black leather on here, which is my dark color. I'm actually going to grab a little bit of like a dark purple tone, work that in because that'll have the, the effect of being a shadowed red. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to work my shadows up into the opposite side. So wherever the opposite is of where I push the light, I'm now going to push some darkness. And I'm going to try where I can to keep the light up against the dark. So like right there, you see how I, see how that's, that bright spot stands out so much more once we put this shadow up against it? So we're just going through, finding all the areas where we where we did this, and we're going to trace some shadows up in here. I'm being a little more careful here because I want to respect my individual lines, hence why I'm not using a big fat brush. 
I'm not being incredibly precise, um, partially because I'm painting on camera. And painting on camera like this is always somewhat difficult. Um, you can also tell where I hold the brush. So when I want to do something very precise, you choke up on the brush. Right? This is something I see a lot of people do. A lot of people, when they hold their brush, they hold it way back here. And then they paint. And, like, this is so much more inaccurate. Because every time I move my hand this much, like, I put my finger that much, the brush moves so much more. Whereas if I go down here, right, I have this very precise control. You'll notice when you watch a lot of, like, uh, high-end painters doing, like, extremely detailed work, they tend to be really choked up on the brush. Hashtag choke up on the brush. Okay. So now we've got this nice light and shadowed effect. We're getting somewhere. But now comes the important part, where we ask ourselves a relevant question, which is, do we want this to be the same red as everything else around it? You know, we've broken it up visually. Or do we want it to be a different color? Understanding what the rest of this miniature is gonna look like and the other colors that are in play here. Now, anytime we introduce a new color, we have to ask ourselves a couple questions. The first question of which is how much of it's going to be on the miniature, right? Because we want color to generally be balanced. If it's extremely minimal, you don't have to worry about it too much. So for example, over here on this guy's shoulder, where we've got vines and roses. There's not a lot of green on this miniature, but green is obviously a complementary color to red and generally works well with it. There's not a ton of green on here, but I'll have little hints of green in things like lights and uh, other small details, other places where this vine pattern pops up. So it won't be totally alone. Like there are little spotlights and stuff on this guy. For example, these little these little things that sit on top of the um, missile pods will have little green lights on them. So we'll be able to spread that out a little bit. But if we introduce a totally new color here, like let's say I made this bright blue, perfectly valid choice. If I did that, then what would happen is I'd have this bright spot of blue, right dead sort of in the center of the top of the miniature, and no other spots of that same blue around. That is to say, unless I knew that I had places, if I, if I have somewhere else on the miniature, I can also do that. Let's say this guy had, uh, if I was working on the other variant that has the sort of giant plasma gun uh, in, in one of his hands, that might be the perfect choice. Because then that giant plasma gun is going to be so much blue if I go with a traditional plasma color. So being able to turn something like this blue is going to be a great opportunity because I can balance it out. Unfortunately, this guy's the Valiant, and the Valiant doesn't have that opportunity. He has a big harpoon, and he has a big flamethrower cannon thing, both of which I've already painted, and both of which are highly metal. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and say, well, let's keep this in the red and into the red spectrum, but we'll make it more interesting. So we're going to grab some Dalarowney FW. Um, this is the... Scarlet ink, which is a nice orange, sort of orange red. So we'll grab some of that. I've already got my purple on there. I'm actually going to go ahead and refresh some additional random tan. Uh, oh, radom, radom tan. I always see letters that aren't there in paint names. Ra radom tan. I don't know what that means. I call it random tan. I'm going to keep calling it random tan. It's a really nice color. It's like a very soft, yellowy, warm white. I swear to you, I've looked at this paint a hundred times and I've never noticed that the N wasn't there until I looked at it on camera. When I looked up and saw the name on camera, I didn't see the N. That's how I noticed it. You see things differently on camera, folks. Um, because that's going to be an excellent color to, to work with to, to draw out the warmth of this. So, what I'm going to do now... So I'm going to take some of my red. I've got it over here on my palette. I'm going to actually draw a little medium. I've got a little just random acrylic medium on my palette. Because this ink is super strong. 
and I really want to get it thinned out. So I'll show you here on this part of the palette exactly how thinned out it is, right? See how thin that is? Let's show you on the back of my hand here where I've got some white, right? Okay, and then what I want to do is we're going to wick off the excess. And we're just going to glaze that over. Just a nice controlled glaze. We're going to cover the shadows as well to warm them up. Right, but what we're starting to get is this nice little effect. Now, 30 minutes ago or whatever, I didn't know this is what I was going to be doing. I was Googling around and I found this image. And that's just it. Sometimes, even on a piece like this, we're going to experiment with some new designs. We're going to see what we like. Because if we don't like it, there's no mistakes. You know what we can do to fix it? Just paint over it. That's it. If I didn't like this, I could fix this in a few minutes. Because I could just reset it back to a base coat. I could just run some neutral color through this entire thing. And boom. It's right back to how it was before. It had very little modulation before. So we can go back. I always go back to neutral. There are no mistakes in painting. You cannot make them. It's not possible. So now what we get is this nice little effect. It almost looks like sort of piled up rocks. Um, and I'll tell you what, I'm kind of super digging it. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know how much I would like this as I started recording this. Um, I've done patterns like this obviously before, but never in this kind of space and in this kind of thing. So now what I'm going to do is I want to refine my shapes. Anytime you're working in and in, in doing something like this where you're creating the textures and the volume, you need to make sure your shapes are very well defined. So here's where I come in and I make sure that my light and dark all have these nice contrast points against each other. Right, so I just kind of, I'm working in that dark red, uh, dark sort of black leather, um, purple color that I had before. And I'm just slowly working some shadows into some places to create a nice hard visual distinction. All right. Then what we're going to do. So we're going to grab some of our, as I refuse to change my ways, random tan. Still kind of thin. A little bit of flow aid on the brush. And then we're going to go ahead and start pulling that down towards these edges. I'm going to make some areas of visual interest here. Just reinforce those highlights. Sharpen them up. Right? Get those nice and hot. One of the keys to doing, I mentioned it before, I'll say it again because it bears repeating many times in this video, is one of the keys to doing this sort of like complex detailed freehand is you're not doing it in one pass. You're trying something, you're pushing it in, you're working the paint around, you see how you like it, and you refine, refine, refine. If you only take one thing from this, I don't even know how long this video is going to be, but let's assume pretty darn long because I know I've already been talking for a while. I've been talking 20 minutes just on these freaking rocks. Um, you know, the key is you keep refining. Now, I'm doing this piece for, let, let me just mention one other thing here. I'm doing this piece for competition. So for me, as close to perfect as I can get it is the bar. That doesn't have to be the bar for you. You can you can do a lot of cool things and not spend as much time in that refinement phase. 
A refinement phase is what takes most of the time. You can sketch out some cool, simple things, get some paint down, and have a and, and have a good time. Like you saw earlier stages of this that I had this in. You can get that stuff out there and stop without making every line perfectly neat, right? Without um, making sure you have every corner perfectly sharp, without layering every, you know, pushing your contrast into the stratosphere or whatever. That's all fine. If, you're, if your goal isn't, you know, if you're not doing like a competition mini, if you're painting for an army or something, and you want to have some cool, but yet still complicated freehand stuff, there's no reason you can't do that. You just don't, you just shorten your refinement phase. Don't worry about every blend being completely smooth. Don't worry about, you know, is your shape exactly right? Just get something down that looks cool. Like, people are going to respect the, the fact that you put in that effort and notice it, right, regardless. Okay, so now I'm going to take some of that red and mix it with some of my darker shadow color. Let's grab a little flow aid. A little more. Because now I want to kind of smooth down the edges of some of these shadows. So again, we always pull in the direction that we want. So here we're pulling a, we're painting a darker color. So we pull toward the shadow. When the brush touches the miniature, I'm moving toward the shadow. I think this kind of has the look of like hot coals. That wasn't what I was going for at the beginning. But we're gonna go ahead and say that I had that planned the whole time. Shh, don't tell anybody. But we were totally going for hot coals. I don't know if you knew that. That's what this was. I don't know how you couldn't see it. Jeez. Okay. And in fact, let's lean into that just a little bit. So, we're going to go back to our tan. Sometimes things evolve as they happen. Push some more of that down here. Now I know what you're saying, Vince, didn't you just glaze this over? Why do you keep covering over your work if you're just going to put the, the color back on? Because each time I'm covering a slightly different amount of these, of these images. And doing so, and then putting the glaze over one, it's a good way to get a nice super bright white. Or, or super bright like red, I should say, I'm sorry is to keep undercoating and then covering in progressively thinner glazes. Um, what you get is this wonderful effect of like a really, really vibrant, radiant red. Um, this is a wonderful trick for Blood Angels, is to, you know, after you do your initial paint on something like a Blood Angel, you can come back and then sort of, I mean, if you want to do the simplest form, just literally dry brush the thing in white and then run another red glaze or two over top of it. All right, so what I'm going to do here to lean into this a little bit I'm going to move this off camera, move my palette up here a little bit, <coughs> excuse me. We're going to grab some of my red ink, right, and I'm going to bring it up here. And then I'm going to grab some of my yellow ink, some of that previous yellow ink I still have on my palette. And we're going to move that up here. And we're going to need a little bit more of that. Let's actually grab some rust too, just a little bit. Yeah. So we make a nice warm orange. Okay, let's get some medium in there. Get a little water in there. Get a little flow aid in there. Okay, now we got something cooking. Okay, always clean our brush after we do a mix. Don't keep, let make sure paint does not get down in the ferrule of the brush. All right, now back to our guy. Let's warm these coals up. Instead of going straight to red, let's get some sort of orangey color in there. So now we're going to take this, and we're going to pull that glaze away from the light color. So 
So we got some fiery coals of judgment here. Sisters like burning things, so seems appropriate. So we're just running a couple glazes right over the top. All right, and now what we've got is we've warmed it up to that orange color. But we're not gonna stop there. We're gonna go back into that red that I previously had because I still want this to be mostly red, mostly these kind of red glowing, red glowing coals exactly as I intended from the beginning. I've rewritten history now at this point. And we're gonna just pick that middle ground. And we're gonna glaze back over with that mid-tone. Just bring that rich red right back in there. But even the red itself will be warmer now because it's now over the orange instead of over just a pure white. All right? Okay. And then our final step is going to be to just create some tiny, tiny little hot points. So we're going to take a little bit of that very thin random tan. I know it's not called random tan, but it is for me. And I'm just going to push a little bit of it right down here at the very ends. Just to really get some spots where we're popping out that heat. Doesn't have to be even necessarily every one. All right? And if we've got a place where the line is a little too strong, like that one feels a little too strong, go back into our orange, just keep the random tan on the brush. And we just kind of smooth out that edge. Nice thin glaze. All right? Okay, so there we go. What was that? About 30 minutes. We went from blank red to I think something that looks pretty darn cool. We got some nice hot coals hidden in our Inquisition symbol. As we intended the whole time. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, doing the skull next and then we'll talk about the banner. So when we do skulls, a very popular thing to paint, um, the important part is to understand sort of the basic anatomy of a skull. So we're going to start with a little bit of a brown black here. We don't want to go straight into pure black. Um, skulls do not have pits into the void <laughs> in, their, uh, in their face, okay? We often use black as a shortcut to show like a socket, an eye socket. But skulls do not have like giant pit, you know, like giant holes into the void. Um, so what I'm going to do is I want to reset a couple paints and then we're going to, and then I'm actually going to, uh, and then I'm actually going to go ahead and color the scroll in because I want the scroll to be realistic. So what I'm going to do is actually work some darker shadows here in the middle and pull some darker shadows down here. I'll do that off camera real quick. Again, we're just pushing the contrast, same as I did up here on the bird. Um, so whereas here on the bird, the transition was brown to uh, sort of white of non-metallic gold. Here on the scroll, I'm gonna work it from a nice creamy white of my Mojave white down into a sort of white gray uh, of the darker shadow colors. So I'm just going to create those shadows and, and contrast on the scroll so it doesn't look flat. And then we'll come back and we'll do the scroll work of how we do writing and we'll do the skull itself. So back in just a moment. All right, so we have our scroll all uh, 
shadowed in there and ready to go, ready to get some text. So now our last flat element is that skull. Oh, that little skull. Always the most fun. Uh, painting skulls is a, a great fun thing. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of glad that Warhammer uh, includes so many skulls because they're actually a really simple item to freehand, so it's fun to work with. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we don't want our skulls to be sort of empty, completely black voids. So what we've got here is a little bit of brown and black, and a skull is a pretty simple shape. There's a little half moon, then you do two little circles out the side for the cheekbones, and then there's a little U underneath. That's it. And your eyes actually rest down here. All right? So we're going to start out with just something like that. Kind of work those in. They rest at that cheekbone level. Okay? The nose on the skull is just going to be two little hashes. So we go like hash number one, hash number two. That's probably too wide, but we can fix it later. And then finally, we've got our teeth, our teeths. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a little line right across there. Make him a little smiley face. We're only going to do top teeth. We're not going to worry about bottom teeth. And then we're just going to mark out our teeth. And there we go. We have a nice little basic skull. All right? Now, there's obviously a lot more to it. And we're done. Hey, easy. Da, 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 da. No, obviously there's a lot more to it. So now we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to take a slightly lighter color of brown. And we're going to just start shadowing in some areas on the skull. The easiest way to do this is really to um, to paint the areas that you're going to create these distinctions for first and then come in later and clean them up. So for example, right over the skull we have this ridge right here. So we're just going to kind of do that. We're going to kind of create our brow line here. We're going to create this eye ridge. Now, these are way too strong initially, okay? And that's all right. That's what we want. It's important, by the way, of the skull to think of your light direction. See this reflection I have right here? This one? I need to heed that. So that's like I have made mention throughout, like, throughout all this, when you're doing freehand, you want a consistent light pattern. There's a light point here, there's a light point here, and here, and here, right? If you look at this reflection, I have told you the light is coming from roughly like this, right? So given that that's the case, this side of the nose would have shadow underneath it. We have a little bit of shadow at the recess of our cheek, like where these cheekbones are, are recessed. And then above every tooth, we have our jawbone shadows. And we're going to also go ahead and pull the corners into shadow. So now we're just going to go ahead and now we've got the lines. We're just going to fill that in. Okay? Because this here is round, right? And so this front area is going to be brighter. My best advice for you when you're, when you're painting skulls and trying to make them look realistic is again, Google images for the art of skulls. Google skull tattoos and stuff like that. There are amazing, like there are people who, skulls are a very popular thing to do in a tattoo. So as a result, there's a lot of people out there who have a lot of really cool skull art tattoos. And you can look at them and draw inspiration because they'll usually work a light and shadow pattern into them. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go into some just pure white. So this is my 
pure mixture of uh, white ink and my golden artist acrylic white. And now what I'm going to do is sketch in the values for where my actual white is. And in general you want to create like a, a light point like that where it's reflecting on the skull. We're going to then trace the top edge there. There'd be an edge coming down like that. This side of the nose would be cast in light. This brow would be brighter as would this side. Right, just think about the bumps you're trying to make. Like, what are the bumps on a skull? Be a little, what is it, phrenologist? Is that what that is? Probably. The center here in between our little jaw ridges would have light towards the bottom. And then we can reinforce our teeth. Right? Maybe we pop a little bit of that out a little more. But we just create those oh, where our bright spots are going to be. Okay? So, right now we have our skull and a basic value sketch of the skull. Now it's just a matter of refinement. That's it. We've done most of the tough work right there by sketching that initial thing out and setting those values. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to grab a little light brown. And this one's actually called light brown. And working with my Mojave white and my light brown and this darker brown and then probably pulling in a little of the black leather shadow. Because what we can do is I can push down my shadow. But basically I'm just going to start working this back and forth. So where I want to really reinforce some darker shadows, say like this side of the skull, which would be cast more, maybe right up here, maybe right here on the sides of the face. Right, I start working some darker shadows, a lot of little touches. This is a, this is a game of little, tiny fractions of change. We're going to take some of my light brown, thin that out some. And then over here, we're just going to start covering over that previous brown with a nice glaze where we want that light to be. We're going to soften those hard lines, smooth that out. All right? So we're just using that glaze to smooth out those lines. Then we're going to grab some of our Mojave White. You've noticed that I've used this Mojave White like a lot throughout this process. There's a reason for that. One, it's a really good color. Two, it's good to use a lot of the same highlight colors and things like that throughout, even when you're working on different substances, because it creates a nice little visual cue, a little visual harmony. And obviously the bottoms of those would be popped out. And with these brow ridges, you want them to be very soft. Like, in the end, you don't want a super hard line right here. Your, your brow ridge doesn't pop that hard to where you need like this transition from like super dark to light. We sketch it in initially to create the shadow to make sure that we have the, the um, sort of the look correct. But then what we're gonna do is we're gonna just slowly back that out through glazes. And by bringing that back down and softening those lines, we can still keep the general principle of the shadow there. It still feels like it's in shadowed. But we get a nice, softer transition. Because we can also take some of that white, sort of some of the off-white, and we can kind of run right along beside where we put that bright white show that it's not a hard, precipitous change, but in fact it's a nice, subtle drop-off. And 
You notice, by the way, that the eyes are looking darker than what they initially did. And that's because when I put that really bright white next to them, the eyes got brighter. Uh, or sorry, they got darker because contrast, right? Um, a black dot never looks so black as when it's sitting alone on a page, uh, on a white page. Put the black dot on, you know, a dark blue page, it barely looks dark at all. Contrast is the name of the game. So now what we do is we're just going to reinforce our shadows here and there where we want to. What we're effectively doing is just making sure that we keep glazing back and forth, we test, we see, okay, do I like that shadow placement there? How's that? Eh, a little too dark. Okay, let me push it back a little bit. So we're just doing these little bitty changes back and forth. And when we push them slowly like this over time, what we get, and this is, you know, a lot of people ask me if when I, when I do freehand like this, they're like, you know, the question comes up of how did you do that? I don't know, slowly, carefully, experimentationally. Like I didn't start out with any defined image of exactly where, you know, sort of every little shred of light and dark was going to be on this skull. I know the general premise of it because I've painted a lot of skulls on things. But a lot of what this is, is me pushing the paint around, kind of testing, do I like it? Does that, do I like how that's sitting there? Does that feel good? Do I need to lighten a part of it? Do I need to darken a part of it? Right, and I step back every so often and look and say, okay, have, have we gotten to a good place? Am I happy with how everything's highlighted, with the detail, you know, etc.? And we just keep pushing those things around until we get to somewhere we like. And I'm literally just dancing between all of these paints, right? Like I grab a little bit of my white and let's go ahead and push that back in here. Because I chewed off a lot of it. But again, it's not a bad thing to keep pushing that color and to keep seeing where it ends up. Because as your paint dries and as you get lots of layers on top of each other, things don't dry exactly like they look when you initially put the brush down. So working like this over time lets you really get a clear image of what you're creating. You can see after that paint dries, how's that skull looking? Do I have enough shadow in there? Do I have enough light in there? Right? So it's just me pushing this paint back and forth, constantly testing out, reinforcing some shadows, taking a look, do I like it? Do I need to go farther? Do I need to soften it? This is perhaps not the most exciting video you've ever watched, but I hope but I often get requests for people to see like the process of how I paint something. So this is what I'm doing right now. It is this is one of the reasons that when people ask me for color recipes, I don't know what to tell you. Because the way that I'm doing this is how I paint most things, which is like 10 different colors just mixed together randomly that I keep pushing around until I get to somewhere I'm happy with. So I can tell you what colors I use in here all day long. I'm not sure what it's going to help you with. It's like asking, I, it, somebody asked me this recently and the joke I made was, that's like asking me, saying you want to get to California. And I say, I went to California recently and I drove there. And they said, 
Oh, I wanted to go to California. What kind of car did you drive? Well, I mean, I can tell you. I'm not sure that's going to help you get to California. You probably want to know the map. You see, the map in this case is the technique. It's an analogy. <laughs> All right. So, we keep pushing that skull around. And at this point, one of the problems is, so like you stop and you look and you say, okay, how's that look? Well, I like some things and I don't like some things, right? And one of the things I don't like about it is that he has, the skull has goggle syndrome, right? Where I've lightened the areas completely around the eyes here and uh, it's too, this area stands out too much vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the miniature, right? So what I wanna do is we need to back some of that out. So we need to figure out where our shadows are and kind of bring some of that back in. So if our light's coming down like this, gonna hit here and here primarily. So we're gonna have more shadow here on that side and here underneath where that curves under. In the same way, we're gonna have a little more shadow here and a little more shadow up here and kind of that reverse. All right, and so now, taking that down a little bit, still probably needs a little more. You gotta really watch for that goggle syndrome with skulls. It's really easy for that to happen. Okay, better. But now we can grab a little bit of the white and we can contrast it in the same way in the opposite direction. So where our light would actually be, say right there. Okay, so we just keep pushing our colors around until we like where we end up, All right? Now he has a little bit of less goggle syndrome. We pulled some of the dark, both through darkening some stuff, but also lighting some of the area above. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is play with this skull some more off camera. I mean, I'm just gonna repeat everything you saw me do for a little while, so I'm gonna keep fixing up this skull, get it to a point where I like it, and it's, I like where we're at. Then we'll come back and the final piece of this will be the scroll. Back in a moment. All right, so got our skull and our shadows are looking decent. Might go back and do some more touch up work on it here and there, but I wanna talk about a, a sort of final point on it. Now is when we go in with our sort of dark black color. So we've got our ink and our paint here. Get a little flow aid into that so we've got it nice and sharp. And now what we're gonna do is now we're gonna make sure that we've got this, that at the top where it would be the most shadowed, this also helps us, it lets us redefine in case any of our white got out of control. Now we can work that shadow in there, right? Doesn't make a huge difference, but it's important because then it really sets off that you have those dark shadows hidden in there, okay? Way up at the top where no light is sneaking in. <clears throat> so our final step here, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to be to put our lettering in, 
right? And uh, for this guy, we're going to use some fancy calligraphy because why not? Why not make this even more difficult on ourselves? <laughs> uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to... So to do that, I don't know how to do calligraphy, but I can pull up a bunch of different calligraphy alphabets on the internet and then break down the component parts and try to replicate them. Okay? So... Uh, what we want to do is, in general, when you're when you're thinking about sort of your when you're thinking about calligraphy for something, there's a couple important things to follow when you're thinking about writing words on things. Uh, a lot of people like to use micro pens. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, um, you can do that. You can use uh, you can use a little micro pen for it. But I'm not generally as hot on that because the pen, like pen ink will spread and you'll get a, a sort of, like a, it'll, it won't look tight. Whereas if you use a little ink and paint mix, you can keep it sharper. The other thing you want to do is you want to keep your word short. Like that is a big important key. You do not want a lot of text. One, because then you're gonna have to write a lot of text, right, which is a problem. And two, because you uh, you don't wanna have to be trying to fit a ton of letters in here, okay? So, like, it, you don't wanna write, like, if I, I wanna make something that's fiery on here, because this guy has this big conflagration cannon, and, and she's here to, you know, sort of burn the heretics, right, that kind of thing. That's fine. Uh, the challenge with that is we don't want to write <laughs> like conflagration or something like, oh my goodness, you know, way, way too long of a, uh, of a word, right? You generally want to stick to like five letters, six letters, something like that. An odd number of letters, this is, this is real inside baseball here. Um, an odd number of letters tends to be better Okay, because, and the reason for that is because then you can center your, your middle letter and do like one, two, one, two, and it becomes easier to balance it. If you have an even number of letters, you've got to balance the two letters off the center of it and then build from there. Okay, so the, my point is, is that you need to think very closely or very carefully, I should say, um, about sort of how you're, what word you're writing here. Uh, in this case, uh, we're going to use, since, since, you know, everything is pseudo Latin, uh, and we have a little more space on this carapace, right? Um, we're gonna, we're still gonna use a, a five letter word, and what we're gonna use is ignis. Right, so we have a little pig Latin thing, so we're gonna go for Ignis. Now, the first thing we wanna do is have plenty of our sort of ink and paint mix ready to go, mixed in with our... And, and this is the kind of thing when you're doing this type of freehand, ink is your best friend. I will tell you right now that trying to do this kind of freehand with just paint is nearly impossible. Because when you turn the brush, let me set that to the side for a moment. I'll do this in the back of my hand. When I turn the brush, I need the bristles to come with me, however I turn it. And if that's thick paint, that's not gonna happen, okay? So I need this to sweep right along with me as I make those turns, okay? All right. So, Got some of our ink and paint mix. We use the paint to bind it in place, the ink to get it flowing. And what we're actually gonna do is we're gonna make five dots. So the first one, I'm gonna center right here in the middle. Right, so it's right on my line. And then I'm gonna go one, two, and one, two. 
and I can do that to make sure that my letters are going to be spaced out evenly. Okay. So, now, let's go from here. Now comes the fun part. Now is where the person who doesn't know how to do calligraphy tries to do calligraphy. <laughs> okay. So we're going to start with the letter N, which I have a little reference of over here. And by the way, don't worry if you don't cover these up. It doesn't matter. You can fix them later. It's a tiny dot. So I'm going to break down my calligraphy N here to the individual shapes, which it has a line right here that goes like this. And then it has a little swoop that comes out of the side. And then we have a little swoop, a little swoop. And then it comes up at an angle. And then we have a long swoop around. And then we have a little swoopy doop off there. All right, so that's the outline of our N. Next up, we have a little baby line down there like that. And then we'll go ahead and connect that one because there's one right across there and one right across there. Kind of looks like an A. There you go, we'll bring that line up a little. Now we have more of an N. Okay. So then, now that I've got my center letter on, then we can go from here. So, over here we've got an I. So our I in this is a really funny looking letter. With our I, we start with a swoop up here, and then we come down and across. Got a little line right there. And then we have another one that runs right beside it that is thinner and connects. Over here with our G. Oh, this is a fun one. All right, with our G, we start with a little swoopy loop back here. And that actually comes all the way around. This goes straight up there. You want to keep make sure you keep refreshing your paint. Like, you notice I go back into my paint pretty often here. Because you need it to be nice and wet and flowing. Then it kind of comes out like that. There's a line that comes down right there. And then this one comes around like that. And then there's a little line there. That's our G. Okay. We get to do our I again on the other side. So here we're going to go ahead and go same thing as last time. Start with our little flat line. Then we come down. We have our little swoop on the end. That. And then we bring the second one. The thin one down. And connect. Alright, and then for our most fun, most terrible of all letters. The letter S. This is a fun one. 
Okay. So our S, this is an annoying one. You notice how I'm angling these to match. We start with a little corner there, and then we swoop around to that. We're going to come up and down. Up here we're going to come to a nice sharp point. And then we're going to go down like that. Then we have our second line that comes in and it connects. And then we have a little fancy cross section that comes down here and connects to that. And that has a little hook on the bottom. And there we go. Woof. There was a lot of breath holding there. Now, if you mess this up, if you're doing some complicated text and it doesn't quite look right or it doesn't quite fit, you can always come in. Again, this is, I hear what you're saying. You're saying, Vince, I thought this seems like you could really mess this up. I thought you said you couldn't make mistakes. You can't. Even with something as complicated and ridiculous as this, like right here, this line doesn't have enough separation. Like on camera, that literally looks like one line. In reality, there's a little bit of space there. So what I can do, like that's meant to be a little space next to the end. It's thin in the real in the real calligraphy. But I can reinforce it over there, right on that side. Let that dry. But then what I can do is I can go into some of my like Mojave White, which is kind of the mid-tone of this thing. Doesn't matter, I hear what you're saying, but Vince, you have this complicated blend underneath, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't matter, you can't see that difference at that micro detail level. So what we do is we come in, and we build that back in, right? So now we can see that space in there. And if you go too far, like I just did again, <laughs> then we go back and forth. And there we go. Now we've got a nice sharp line and we've got space in between. If you have ink that sort of bleeds or anything like that, if anything gets squirrely, you can fix it up using the same trick. So. Like over here, this S got a little squirrely up top where it's kind of going above. You see that? So what I'm going to do is I'll take some of my white, mix it with my gray tone that I was working in for the top of the shadow. And we'll just hit that right there. Little stipples to just cover that right over. Same inside there. Right, so we can get it nice and thin, nice and fixed up exactly how we want it. So I'll push this around probably a little bit off camera, but realistically, there you go. That's it. There's our finished detailed freehand. I'll probably look at it and if a few other things strike me, like I thought about maybe putting a crack in the skull or something like that, or maybe uh, something burned into his forehead. I might play with it a little more. The final phase is just detailing, fixing all the individual elements. Like, see how that spot isn't very clean right there? Like, see that? There's like a, where the paint isn't clean. We're gonna sharpen any final lines, really look over this with a fine tooth comb and get it perfect. But that's because this is a competition piece. But that's how you do it. That's detailed freehand. I am not an artist. I have no artistic training whatsoever other than like taking an easy class in high school because I didn't want to I didn't want to take something else that was hard um, this is just literally working paint back and forth looking for inspiration out there in the world and then building it slowly over time so this is a long video I appreciate you if you made it all the way through it we're gonna sum up real quick 
Number one, we start with an image search. We look around, we look at other people who've done stuff, we look at what they've done, we draw inspiration from out in the world, from miniatures, from art, from comics, from anything you've seen. Then we make a version of it. We draw it on paper, maybe a couple times, until we get a rough sketch or idea of what we want. Then we come in here. We sketch it out in pencil to get to where we want to be. Very lightly, we create our edges, make sure everything's going to fit. Then we start laying down some base tones, right? Just sketching out the outlines. Then we put in our highlights. Where are our highlights going to be? Where are our shadows going to be? We start planning that out, thinking about how that's going to look. Then we build in our color all over where we put in where we want our color. Then we refine, we refine, we refine, we refine. It's okay if we don't know everything. We can make decisions later on like we did with our hot coals. I mean, you know, like we planned the whole time. And we push the image back and forth. We always make sure that the image is doing what we want. We make sure that the image has high contrast, that it's drawing attention in the direction we want. I want the, the eye to move down this way, hence the triangular nature of this shape, hence the way that I place the lights so it comes down. Everything here says, look at this guy's face. Look here, now move your eye down. Everything is built like that, to follow the natural carapace and curve and to point you toward the face of the miniature. So there you go. That's it. And now, of course, after I'm done with all this, I'm going to put battle damage over top of it and screw it up, like, which is always a fun step. So after I spent 20 hours doing this, uh, I'm going to now chip it and rust it and streak it and put grime over top of it because that's how we do it. And it's fun. Uh, but at any rate, that's detailed freehand. Uh, I know this was a long one, but I hope this was helpful to how I sort of think about these things and do these things. I hope it was interesting for you. Give it a like if you liked it, if you made it all the way through. I appreciate that. Uh, subscribe for more hobby cheating. I promise they're not all this long. Uh, share this if you know somebody who wants to do some, some fun freehand on maybe their robots or uh, their tanks or whatever. But as always, I thank you very much for watching this one, and we'll see you next time.